So today we're going to take a quick dive into another value within the DNA of this church. We've began this series called DNA with the mission of the church and the first value, which is Christ-centeredness. Today I want to look at another value, and that value is compassionate conviction. Compassion is an adjective that describes the ability to feel or show concern for others. Compassion. Conviction is the quality of showing that one is firmly convinced of what they believe. Compassionate conviction. We believe that you can hold these two together as a church. We believe that you can be firmly convinced of what you believe while carrying the ability to feel and show concern for others as you are sharing what you believe. To state this another way, it simply means to communicate the words of Jesus the, in the way of Jesus. Communicating the words of Jesus in the way of Jesus. Truth without a doubt matters. Without a doubt, truth matters. But the motivations and the attitude and the manner and the posture in which we communicate truth also matter. They matter significantly. And the way, the posture, and the manner in which we communicate that truth say something about the one that's communicating the truth, and it affects how people will receive that truth. One of the reasons why this has become or this became an early value of our church is because we became fully convinced that in our day and in our time, there may not be a greater gap in our discipleship than how we speak to one another. Part of, the, part of the struggle with multi-ethnic, multicultural ministry, when you're trying to, when you're trying to labor and build, um, build a church by God's grace or, the, or, or trying to serve in building a church by God's grace that is crossing all of these different lines, one of the major obstructions is how we talk to each other. And so relationships of every type are being destroyed because simply put, we don't know how to talk to one another. Marriages, families... Friends, and yes, churches are too often divided because we lose our ability to speak to or hear each other. However, compassionate conviction is not just important because of the relationships that we're losing. Compassionate conviction is also important because of the gospel witness that we're putting at risk whenever we don't operate in it. You see, we too often as Christians pursue truth without compassion. And we place our gospel credibility on the line to win arguments. So as long as we're right, doesn't matter how it came out. Or sometimes we flip the script and we focus all on the compassion and we pursue compassion without truth and lose all of our distinctiveness just in order to be accepted and liked by everybody. So this value is about holding this tension together in such a way that we preserve our witness while maintaining our distinctiveness. The Bible in several places highlights the importance of this value. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 reads, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, as all, or rather always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do that with gentleness and respect. In other words, we honor Christ in part by staying ready to share gospel truth concerning Christ. But we do it in a way that we stay ready, not so that we can badger and mock the people that we're sharing Christ with, but that we are ready to share an answer with gentleness and respect. Another verse that highlights this, the importance of this value is Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. It says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt. Again, you hear this, listen, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So Paul and Peter are both saying, be prepared to answer, but be prepared to answer in a particular way. Stay ready to share the hope. Stay ready to share the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But stay ready to do so with graciousness and not with a lack of love, just for a lack of love's sake. 
Are we sinners that have routinely fallen short of the glory of Jesus Christ? Yes, without question. Did Jesus Christ come to earth through a virgin and live a perfect life and a righteous life that we never could live? Yes, without question. And in so doing, did he satisfy the righteous requirements of God the Father that were necessary to bring us into right fellowship with God? Yes. And so go and share that without apology, but give the same energy that you give in sharing those words, give the same energy to sharing them with gentleness, graciousness, compassion, empathy, and love. The passage that we most refer to through the years in City Light when we are trying to draw out the significance of compassion and conviction is this chapter, Ephesians 4, verse 15. It says, very simply and plainly, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Speaking the truth, conviction. Speaking in love, compassion. I love Tony Evans, Dr. Tony Evans' concise but powerful definitions in this passage of truth and love. This is what he says about truth. He says, truth is what God says about a matter. It isn't always pretty, and sometimes it confronts some things that are tough to address, which makes it all the more important that it is spoken in love. So truth is what God says about a matter, but Tony Evans, according to Evans, love is the compassionate, righteous, and responsible seeking of well-being of the recipient. Compassionate, righteous, and responsible seeking of the well-being of another. That's what love is. When we are committed to speaking what God says while compassionately, righteously, and responsibly seeking the well-being of the one that we are sharing that truth with, then we are speaking the truth in love. Does that make sense? So let's take a moment over the next couple of moments and consider a few observations about speaking the truth in love. Observation number one, whether the truth we have to communicate is hard or whether the truth we must communicate is easy, the call, to, the call to communicate that truth should always be fueled by love. Whether the truth we have is hard or easy, the call to communicate that truth should be fueled and shaped by love. You say, what's the significance of that? Well, we too, easy, we too easily believe the myth that communicating a difficult truth is always easier than communicating an easy truth. But we never factor, we rarely factor. My wife and I don't use terms like never and always. Y'all can come to some of those marriage, marriage uh, seminars and learn more about that. But we, but we rarely factor how much communicating with love impacts our equation when we're trying to figure out what is easy and what is hard. So we think, oh, okay, if this, is an e this, this is an easy truth to communicate, then it's easy. But is it shaped by love? Because that factors into that equation. Let me, let me share with you a little bit. Let me go a little bit further with this. So you can speak hard truth unloving. Most of us know that. You spend five minutes on social media, you'll see that. You know that to be true. Over and over again, you see Christians, Christians who are absolutely looking to get their dunks in on other believers. They can't wait. Can't wait to pounce. Or worse yet, they're looking to get their dunks in on people who were maybe in the church but now have left the church. Or worse yet, they're turning their dunks on the people in the church. They can't wait to dunk on people. And many of these people wake up every day bright and early. And they brush their teeth and then they run to their phones so they can lob truth bombs over the fence. It's like an addiction and they can't stop it. And why is that? Why, why is that the case? Well, it turns out that there's some actual science behind it. Studies show that hatred does a number of things that attract and draw people to it. In an article written by the good folks at Science of People, they state that hatred, for one, has the ability to help people define the in-groups and the out-groups in their societies. And so this formation helps people form bonds and feel deeper connections with people that they most agree with. And so the hatred helps them form bonds with the people that they like. It strengthens their bonds in some cases. And so you often see the Christian legalist community tight as thieves, 
as they continue to spout truth in increasingly harsh and demoralizing ways to separate themselves from the church and say, hey, look at our community. We're so tight-knit while these other folks are all going to hell. But another reason that we're so drawn to hateful speech, according to another study, is that it can typically evoke a stronger response than a mutual like. Hate has a stronger response in many cases than like. And here's how the people at Science of People describe it. They, they cite a study that, that took place where people were shown a video of two people having a conversation in which the man is politely hitting on the woman in the video. And after, being, if they are, and after being asked if they liked or disliked the man, they were told they were going to meet people who shared the same opinion of, them, of the man and asked how likely they were going to get along with the person they met. And people who had a negative opinion of the man were far more likely to say they would get along well with someone who shared the same negative opinion than those who said they had a positive opinion. We enjoy being around people who hate the same things that we do. Hatred gets a strong reaction. We even see it in how social media is constructed for the longest time. And I'm not sure how much of it they do now because they're starting to get cited more and more, but I think they're still doing some of it, but I can't prove that. But for the longest time, social media was literally programmed in such a way where you, the user, were incentivized to share the harsh content. It was the harsh content that went viral. It was the hateful content that went viral. It was the harshest of criticisms that caught wind. Because even social media experts realized, and many of them regrettably realized this, that people just love to hate. But here's another observation that was made. Sharing hatred can often be a powerful expression of vulnerability. In other words, we need vulnerability to form lasting intimate bonds and we sometimes get the strongest sense of vulnerability when we are demonstrating our hatred for someone that has hurt us or hurt someone else that we love. And so the vulnerability creates strong bonds with others who share a similar distaste for that person or those people. This can explain why sometimes we see a group of people who spend all of their energy and all of their time sharing hateful takes on the church because they've been wounded by the church. And then that vulnerability creates a bond with other people who have been wounded by the church. And now they come together and their literal life's ambition is just to hate the church and to talk about how much they hate the church. Now notice, I didn't say that any of what was being shared in those previous examples had to be untrue because it can very well be accurate, but although it is accurate, sharing it in an unloving way doesn't make it false. Sharing it in an unloving way has been proven to just be enticing but it is completely ineffective in winning anybody from the other side of your argument. Some of you married folks don't even have to leave your home to understand this truth. How often have you communicated a hard truth in a callous, rough, and uncaring or inconsiderate way and had your spouse respond with light in their eyes? Thank you so much, sweetie for that very violent but very accurate tongue lashing. You are absolutely right. I am exactly like that. But I am so ready to do better now. No, it's, that's not how it happens. It's not how it works. It's mostly met with resistance, right? Because the most effective way of winning those we love with truth is speaking that truth in love. So we can speak hard truth unloving, but guess what? We can also speak easy truth unloving. And how do you do that? Well, typically, we do this when truth spoken becomes an opportunity for us to get what we want. In other words, I can use flattery, not because I care for the well-being of the one I'm speaking to, but because I'm thinking primarily about what that person I'm speaking to can offer me. Take, for example, a man that's telling a beautiful woman that she is beautiful. She may in fact be beautiful, that may be true. 
And that is an easy truth to share if she is. But if, if he is sharing that truth for the purpose of getting her to lower her guards so he can have a chance to sleep with her, then it is an easy truth spoken unlovingly because it is a truth spoken in consideration of not her, but spoken in exploitation or the hopes to exploit her. Let's use, a, let's use an example that dives a little closer to the church house. Let's say a preacher is driving home the point of the Christian needing to be generous by encouraging his members to be generous. That is true. And that isn't even really that controversial. As Christians, we know that God holds gener generosity very high on his list for us to follow and walk in. That's the easy truth. However, what if the reason he is sharing that is because he is seeking money for his own private jet? It then becomes unloving truth because he is taking the tool of God's words and wielding it not for the building up of others, but for the building up of himself at the cost of exploiting others. Do you understand? Again, whether the truth we have is to communicate is hard or whether the truth we have to communicate is easy, the call to communicate that truth should always be fueled by love. Here's another observation. When practicing speaking the truth in love, when we take away one or the other, it ceases to be either. When practicing speaking the truth in love, when we take away one or the other, it ceases to be either. In other words, God's truth is not true in the way he intended it to be when spoken unlovingly. Because love, listen, because love is part of that truth that he has given us. And God's love is certainly not love in a way that he intended it when shared absent of truth because truth is a significant part of the love that he has given us. Does that, does that make sense? Let me share an illustration. It is not loving to just have people think that you believe all roads lead to heaven because John 3.16 tells us that part of God demonstrating his love towards us was his sending of his son, Jesus Christ, to us in order to save the world. So kindly keeping all of that necessary truth from people is not necessarily the loving thing to do. So we must find compassionate, considerate, responsible, gentle ways to articulate these truths to those who desperately need to hear them because that's what it means to love them. But it is also not loving to watch friends continue behavior that the Lord has said will lead to destruction, right? Just because you don't want them to get mad at you for bringing corrections. Sometimes your friends will have to hear corrections from you. But you must strive to share it with them how? Lovingly, compassionately, righteously, responsibly, seeking the well-being of the one you're sharing that truth with. So when we speak in loving terms, absent of truth, we are not loving well. We are simply enabling people. And this is typical when we are operating not out of love, but out of fear. Fear of man. Concerned about their opinions, right? Concerned about their acceptance. But when we speak truth in truthful terms, absent of love... We are not being good truth tellers. We are simply tearing the other down. And this is typical when we are operating out of self-righteous contempt for others. One author gives this great illustration that highlights the importance of holding this tension between truth and love. He says, loving someone without truth is like being a bad Uber driver. It's like being a driver who is meticulous about the comfort of his passengers but doesn't have any navigation skills whatsoever in terms of how to get to where they need to go. So they make sure the temperature in the car is good. They're playing the passenger's favorite music. They got a plethora of phone charging cords. You ever been in one of those Ubers? You get in the back and, they, and, the, and the guy or the guy has all the right charges for you to plug in. You're like, man, this is nice. You know, that's, that's, how, I, that's how I think about it. Guy has no, no idea how to get you where you're trying to go. 
end up dropping you off miles away from where they actually need to. And so the author says that similarly, similarly, when we fall into the trap of loving others without speaking truth, we end up wandering aimlessly. And this is what happens when we are kind and we are polite and we are caring and we are compassionate, but we fail to bring the truth of God and the gospel to bear when a person is struggling. On the other hand, speaking truth without love can also be compared to a bad Uber driver. He continues, just in a different way. This guy knows exactly where he's going, but he has no interest in your comfort, no interest in your safety. He picks you up. He's in a, Arthur says, he's in a beat-up 1973 Ranchero, filled to the roof with fast food garbage. You look on the, you hop in the, you hop in the car, you look in the back, and there's like a, coy, a coyote carcass in the back seat. And he's just racing down the street, getting you to your destination, but your life is at risk the entire time. When he arrives at the destination, to his discovery, the passenger has already jumped out of the car miles ago. Said, I'm off this ride. Because they, because this past, because he knows how to get them there, but he doesn't care how he gets them there. That's speaking the truth without love. Do you understand that? Many people, many of you are wondering why some of the people in your life have gotten off of the ride. And some of you have surmised that it's because you were speaking truth. That could be true. It very well could be true. But it also could be true that you were absent of love. Here's another observation. When we speak the truth in love, we are participating in the spiritual growth of the saints and the maturation of the church. When we speak the truth in love, we are participating in the spiritual growth of the saints and the maturation of the church. Pay attention to the flow of Paul's exhortation in this text, before, through, and after verse 15. He says in verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. For him, the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, keep in mind that what Paul has in mind here, he talks about the apostles and prophets, is most likely the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles, not necessarily people with apostolic and prophetic gifting and leanings. It was these folks, the apostles, Old Testament prophets, New Testament apostles that established the foundation of the church by speaking the truth in love. And then the evangelists come along. These ministers who were gifted for outreach into the world, sharing the gospel and making disciples. How did they do that? By speaking the truth in love. And then they leave behind these new saints that form local churches. And then the pastors and shepherds and teachers come along entrusted to the local church, daily building these saints up by speaking the truth and love. And Paul says all of these are laboring to equip the body, mature the body, deepen our unity in the body, deepen our knowledge of Christ in the body, deepen our maturity in Christ. And then he says in verse 14, so that we will no longer be children carried around by every worldly doctrine, carried around by every worldly philosophy, carried around by every, every uh, worldly enticing lie that's posing as truth. So that we won't be tossed around by every worldly doctrine that says some people are infer inf inherently rather inferior than, than others or inherently inferior to others based on nothing than color. When God has declared that every human being has been created in his image and in his likeness. So that we won't be tossed around by every worldly doctrine that says that the children growing in, in wombs of mothers have no value. When God has already declared that they are fearfully and wonderfully made. 
so that we won't be tossed around by every worldly doctrine telling us that the more we acquire, the more valuable we are. When God has, every, has already said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? So that is what Paul says is the purpose of all of these ministers in these ministries, apostle, prophet, teachers, pastors, evangelists. They are equipping the saints, building them up so that they will no longer be children. They will mature. But how are they doing that? Not with craftiness, not with shadiness, not with deceitfulness, not with bad doctrine. But instead, Paul says, speaking the truth in Love, speaking the truth in love, aids the church in maturation. It aids the church in growing up into Christ and in return being fed through Christ. Let me say it more plainly. Speaking the truth in love is a sign of and a tool for our maturation. Man, I've been saved for a long time now, 26 years, in fact. And earlier in my life, my my salvation life, I had a tendency to equate knowledge with maturation, zeal for maturation. And so I would speak truth much more harshly to people than I do now. Speak truth without regard for their well-being. Speak truth absent of gentleness. And it was not only a sign of immaturity in me, but it was a tool that was being leveraged by Satan to build immaturity in the people who looked up to me. You tracking with that? Because they, in turn, will learn how to communicate truth in similar ways, accurate on the facts, absent on the love. This is the era of many young Christians and, unfortunately, a few old ones. Maturation comes about not just simply through the acquisition of truth, but through the love that is given to us during the acquisition of that truth. I bet you can say along with me that probably beyond a shadow of a doubt, those who have had the biggest impact on your spiritual maturity are those who spoke truth to you while loving you. It wasn't just simply those that spoke truth. And it wasn't simply just those who just showered you with compassion. But those who had the most impact on your maturation are those who spoke truth while loving you. Because in order to serve people and building them up and maturing them, it requires that we speak truth in love. Pursue one absent of the other, and you will more than likely shortchange the maturation process process altogether, or even worse, set it back. By the way, this is not just the local church. This is not just discipleship. This is your marriage. This is your marriage. You want to find the quickest way to maturing your marriage? It's not just speaking truth, folks. It's not just, you want to burn a house up? Just go around speaking truth. (laughs) Just go around speaking truth. It's literally like you walking around with gasoline and just holding matches. Just, (laughs) Just go around speaking truth. That will set that whole thing ablaze. But if you want to mature a marriage, speak truth wrapped in love. I got a witness in here. (laughs) So how do we walk this out? How do we walk in compassionate conviction? How do we walk in speaking truth and love? Here's the last two, and they're quick. Number one, remember that speaking the truth in love is a work of the heart. Observation number four, remember that speaking the truth in love is a work of the heart. Paul David Tripp, in a wonderful book that I would encourage you to pick up called War of Words, declares that the war of words is a war for the heart. And he is absolutely right. And not only is he right, but he is in line with Jesus. Because this is what Jesus says about this ideal of speaking the truth in love or compassionate conviction. 
Luke chapter 6, verse 45, it says, the, God, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So compassionate conviction begins in our hearts. Speaking the truth in love begins in our hearts. Anytime we as Christians find ourselves unable to walk in it, anytime we find ourselves unable to walk this out, we should ask ourselves, what is going on in me that would cause me to speak in that way? You know, sometimes we just let ourselves off the hook, right? We say something outlandish, crazy, put it out there. And then what do we do? Man, I didn't mean to say that. (laughs) Let's do a little bit more work than that. Let's do a little bit more work than that. Don't just let yourself off the hook. Let's let's, let's dive in and figure out where did that come from? That's the question. Not, not, Not a statement, I didn't mean to say that. Where did that come from? Because when you find yourself speaking truth with very little patience and compassion and grace and love for someone that you are speaking to, and even when you're doing that, uh, speaking to some people one way, but then speaking to others a totally different way, absent of love, before you cast blame on those and say it's their fault that you're speaking this way, first ask the Lord to reveal if there is something in you that is prohibiting you from speaking truth in love. Is it contempt? Maybe it's the the type of contempt that you're carrying for people who are still bound in their sin. So when you're talking to people who are still struggling in in your sin, you got no patience for them. Maybe there's contempt there that would cause your words to be filled with gentle and subtle disdain for the people that you're talking to. Or maybe it's an overinflated view of your own righteousness that would cause your words to be filled with pride. Subtle hints of pride as you look at people and say, can't believe you're doing that. Right? What's there? What's going on in there? Or is it your elevated, or maybe you've elevated yourself over others and failed to remember that we were all created in the image and in the likeness of God. And we all have fallen short of that glory. And we are all in need of his grace. Ask the Lord to reveal what's happening in you that leads you or led you to what's being spoken out of you. Because here's the reality that we must deal with. One of the reasons why we don't exercise compassionate conviction towards those whom we are speaking with is because we don't carry as much compassion towards those whom we are speaking with as we think we do. We are short of compassion, and it comes out in our speech. On the flip side, when you find yourself unable to share truth and only covering people around you with sentimentalism, ask the Lord to reveal if there is something in you that is prohibiting you from speaking the truth in love. Is it the fear of man that is causing man's opinion of you to be bigger than God's acceptance of you in Christ? But do the work. Don't let yourself off the hook. Here's the last thing. Observation number five. Remember that the truth we we now live in visited us in love. Remember that the truth we now live in visited us in love. Jesus Christ, the full embodiment of truth. He declares to us in John chapter 14, verse 6, that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And it was was from love that this truth, Jesus Christ, the truth, came down to us. Because God the Father, John, or rather John 3.16, we hear that God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only son. He gave us the full embodiment of truth that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Out of love, he sends truth. And it was this Jesus that John declares that when he came, he came in grace and truth. 
He was the full embodiment of truth, but not absent of compassion, not absent of grace, not absent of mercy, not absent of gentleness. His truth roared like a lion, yet his posture was gentle like a lamb. When we reviled him, he spoke truth, but he spoke it mercifully. He responded with mercy all the way to the cross. When he rose in triumph in his resurrection, he didn't show up to all of his disciples thumping his chest like, I told y'all, I told y'all I was going to get up. It's not, he, 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 what did he do? With compassion. With compassion. He met Thomas, right? Thomas said, I believe it when I see it. Got to see his nail-scarred hands. With compassion, he showed up and he showed Thomas the nail-scarred hands. He said, feel it. Feel my side. Feel my hands. With compassion, he shared truth. When Peter denied him over and over and over again and cursed the folks that say, I think you've been with him, what did he do when he showed up with Peter? With compassion. He denied him three times. With compassion, he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Restoring him in the same way that he denied him, compassionately speaking truth to Peter. He declared the truth about himself to all with love. He's doing so even now today with us. Every single time Satan brings an unloving charge, a hateful charge. Listen, listen, a hateful charge that carries a lot of semblance of truth to it. This man is a sinner. You're right. Every time Satan brings that hateful charge, this man is a sinner or this woman is a sinner. He's right about me. I'm not sure about you. He is right about me. But every single, because every single day I sin. Every single day I sin against my precious God. I fail to meet his holy standard. And yet the Lord graciously and compassionately speaks the truth in love, responding back to those hateful, hateful words from Satan. There is therefore now no condemnation by those who are in Christ Jesus for the law of spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Saints of God, we speak truth and love to others because we have one who is speaking truth and love to us over and over daily in our lives. He is speaking truth and love. And so you respond out of what he's done for you, meaning that because he is speaking truth and love to us, what choice do I have but to pursue to speak truth and love towards others. This is compassionate conviction. And by God's grace and with his strength from his spirit, may we learn to walk in it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.